Katya, you have the call. Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to an MSTELA webinar on engaging Native American youth in learning. And the webinar today is hosted by the National Clearinghouse for English Language Acquisition, MSTELA, located at the Graduate School of Education and Human Development at the George Washington University, and funded through a contract with the U.S. Department of Education's Office of English Language Acquisition. Our mission here at Instella is to provide technical assistance information to state and local educational agencies on issues pertaining to English language learners. My name is Katya Flemens, the research scientist at Instella, and your webinar facilitator. Welcome, everyone. And just some technical announcements and disclaimers. The content of this webinar, including information or handouts, do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of the U.S. Department of Education, nor does the mention of trade names, commercial products, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government. If at this time you do not hear us or you're having technical difficulties, please uh, call 1-866-229-3239. We are still taking questions, and questions may be submitted. Um, by clicking the third tab on the top right-hand corner of your screen, Q&A, and it may be submitted in chat format, in the text format, excuse me, in the chat box. Thank you, and we will begin our webinar with, we have a wonderful uh, presenter here today, and I will allow Trinidad Torres Carrion from the Education Program Specialist of the Office of English Language Acquisition to go ahead and make her remarks, and then I'll introduce Dr. John Rayner. Oh, thank you, Kathy. I just would like to um, thank you all for participating with us in this interesting and webinar, and we are hoping that everybody leaves today after this um, webinar with ideas, strategies that will help them um, when working with the Native American population. So um, thank you very much. Enjoy. That's it, Tatia? Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so you're going to, you're going to be presenting Dr. John, so yes. Yes, and I, we have a wealth of information that will be presented today by Dr. John Rayner, who has so many years of experience. He mm -hmm. is a professor at the Department of Education, uh, Department of Educational Specialties at the College of Education at the Northern Arizona University. And I will go ahead and let Dr. Uh, Rayner begin, uh, since we're going to be really engaging today in a lot of the information that he has to share with us. Uh, Dr. John Rayner? Thank you, Katie and Trina. Uh, Trini. Uh, <laughs> I'll just start in here. This is my first webinar, so uh, from this uh, end, so bear with me. Uh, I think if you want to engage Native American learners, you need to know something of the history of colonial education in this country uh, and why some American Indian students and their parents uh, have ambiguous feelings about education in terms of the boarding school era where actually kids were forced to go off to boarding schools for four or five years at a time and sometimes didn't visit their parents during that time. And, of course, it's not unique to the United States. Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and other countries had this same type of colonial education In my history research, I came across an autobiography of a one-room schoolhouse teacher in South Dakota on the reservation who went on to become an Indian agent, and he wrote in that autobiography the Indian Bureau, which is now the Bureau of Indian Education, went on the assumption that any Indian custom was per se objectionable, whereas the customs of the whites were the ways of civilization. And you can see how this might turn off the... Uh, parents. 
Dr. Lori Alvizo, Al- Alvizo Albert, the first Navajo woman surgeon and now currently associate dean at the Dartmouth Medical School, wrote in her autobiography, The Scalpel and the Silver Bear, on how her parents were punished for speaking Navajo in school. Uh, and that Navajos were told by white educators that in order to be successful, they would have to forget their language and culture and adopt American ways. They were warned that if they were taught their children to speak Navajo, the children would have a harder time learning in school, and they would therefore be at a disadvantage. A racist attitude existed. Navajo children were told their culture and life ways were inferior, and they were made to feel they could never be as good as white people. And she concludes that her father suffered terribly from these events and conditions. That two or three generations of our tribe have been taught to feel shame about our culture, and parents had often not taught their children traditional Navajo beliefs, or I've been on the Blackfeet Reservation a couple of years as a school principal on the Rocky Boy Reservation in Montana, and they had similar experiences. That the traditional beliefs weren't taught, and that was the thing that could have shown them how to live, the very thing that could have kept them strong. Uh, and so what I'm going to stress in this presentation as a way to engage Native American learners is to use culture-based education that doesn't try to replace Native culture but builds on it to produce bicultural, bilingual students or bi-dialectical because a lot of American Indian students today uh, come to school speaking English. That the government schools were very effective in getting rid of the language, the, the native languages. They're trying to revitalize them, many of the tribes now. But what's interesting to me is the reservations I worked on where the kids came to school speaking English, their test scores on English language tests were no higher than the kids that came in several places that I was principal and administrator and teacher at where the kids were still coming speaking their native language. That uh, just speaking English is not the solution to the problem, though obviously we want to produce bilingual English speaking students. So this is a diagram out of some uh, Hawaiian research with native Hawaiian students on culture-based education producing socio-emotional development of self-worth, cultural identity. Uh, This, I think, strengthens kids to persist and to be resilient when they're faced with struggles, whether in school or out of school, and that this has positive educational outcomes. And I'll cite some research later on in this presentation that it uh, produces better student achievement and There are also uh, studies that show it produces better student behavior, and all teachers like well-behaved students. sure makes teaching easier. Uh, I wanted to start out with some stuff on the United Nations that goes way back to the formation of the United Nations, their Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children. And some of the English-only laws now are taking away parental rights. And, of course, the old boarding schools definitely did that. States' parties in this declaration declared that the development and respect for the child's parents, his or her own cultural identity, language and values for the national values of the country. So this is bicultural in which the child is living, the country from which he or may originate, and for the civilizations different from his or her his or her own. And of course, in this era of globalization, we want to start with the place, the community, and the culture of the child, but we want to expand that to their state, to their nation, and to the world. And uh, in 2007, the United Nations adopted the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and, uh, and President Obama has signed on to this, uh, and it declares that indigenous peoples, and that's Native Americans, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, and individuals have the right not to be subject to forced assimilation or destruction of their culture. Article three, 13 declares that 
indigenous peoples have the right to revitalize, use, develop, and transmit to future generations their histories, languages, oral traditions, philosophies, writing systems, literatures, and to designate and retain their own names for communities, places, and persons. In Arizona, the they used to be called Papago, but now they that was a name that others gave them, and they the Tohono O'odham have taken back their traditional name for their tribe, uh, and and other tribes are doing that and, and renaming some of their uh, places uh, on their uh, nation to uh, correspond to the traditional names rather than names that outsiders gave them. And then Article 14, they have the right to establish and control their education systems and institutions providing education in their own languages in a manner appropriate to their cultural methods of teaching and learning. And, of course, the United States has been doing some of this uh, long before the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, I met my wife when she was teaching at Rough Rock Community School, uh, which is on the Navajo Nation, and it was founded in 1966 as the first Indian-controlled school in modern times in the United States. Uh, this is uh, some signs from a protest in Phoenix, though, back around 2001 when uh, the, the voters of Arizona passed uh, English-only legislation that uh, largely banned bilingual education. For, uh, it was, of course, aimed at uh, Hispanics. But uh, Navajo Nation president came out strongly against this. He uh, declared that the preservation of the Navajo culture, tradition, and language is the number one guiding principle of the Navajo Nation. And the Navajo Nation is the largest. There are more people in the census that claim to be Cherokee, but the Navajos are the next, and they have the largest reservation and the largest land area. And this results of assimilation. We like people to be like us, but the National Research Council found that immigrant youth, these would not be Native American, of course, though many Mexicans have a lot of uh, uh, American Indian uh, ancestry, they found that immigrant youth tend to be healthier than their counterparts from non-immigrant families. They come to this country, they start eating with, at McDonald's, they start uh, watching Hollywood films and TV. Uh, the longer immigrant youth are in the U.S., the poorer their overall physical and psychological health. Furthermore, the more Americanized they became, the more likely they were to engage in risky behaviors such as substance abuse, unprotected sex, and delinquency. And if you're interested, I have uh, a reference list at the end of this presentation that gives these uh, where you can find uh, the titles and everything for these books. Uh, some years ago, I spent a year on uh, at Tuba City on the Navajo Nation, and I went to my son Sosie's uh, parent night at school and started talking to his chemistry teacher, Mansell Nelson, and he told me the story of why, how his uh, best chemistry student, a Navajo girl, asked him, why are we learning chemistry? And you can see why a student, and this is the best student in class, this isn't a potential dropout, might not be an engaged learner. When they're in a school classroom and the subject matter is so decontextualized and disconnected that they ask, why are we in here learning this? And he began to make chemistry relevant to the lives of his Navajo students. He started taking lo local community issues and challenges and teaching chemistry around them. Uh, issues of water quality. Were, the local water department was putting in more chlorine than they had to, considering the purity of the water. Diabetes, a major health problem on many reservations. And uranium mining. Uh, some of these kids' grandparents were dying of radiation sickness because they had worked in the uranium mines in the area in the uh, 40s and 50s, and uh, nobody had told them about radiation. So uh, here at Northern Arizona University, where I've taught for the last 16 years, I've been really 
interested in culture, place, and community-based education, tying education to the lives of their students to start whoever those students are, in this case for this presentation, Native American students, and tying it to their heritage, land, and lives. Uh, incidentally, this book is online, full text, if you uh, want to uh, Google it. Uh, Dr. Sandra Fox was a longtime Bureau of employee, and this is a cover of a book uh, published by the National Indian School Boards Association. Uh, sometimes I think people think that, oh, we're just going to teach culture, uh, traditional ways of life and stuff to this, but uh, you can connect science and, 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 and strong academic content to uh, culture-based education. And uh, I think I, I talked about this Navajo student that could not see why she was in a chemistry class. She couldn't, you know, if I was asked why I was taking, taking chemistry when I was in high school, I'd say it's to go to college. But those students were mostly, uh, their parents hadn't been to college. They might not even think college was a possibility. Uh, so they don't have that kind of parental, uh, you know, their parents have been to college, and this is something you do to go to college. Uh, and, and then there can be this uh, reaction to uh, the old, the history, the folk history that goes on. The Navajos were rounded up during the Civil War and put in a concentration camp on the Texas-New Mexico border where the half of them died. The Cherokee went over the Trail of Tears. There can be a lot of uh, negative feelings among uh some minority groups, blacks, some of their ancestors were slaves. And and schooling can be seen as something that's a white thing and not something for us. Of course, Asians laugh at that because uh, Asian history with reading and writing and literacy goes back millenniums. But uh, it, it's a much more recent thing for uh, Native Americans, the the, the the reading and writing, uh, and school, uh, basically learning from Native Americans, from what I can see, was a matter but before 1492 was apprenticeship. You didn't go to school. You apprenticed with elders. Uh, Dr. Demeret, we had a conference three years ago here, and uh, he uh, came and spoke on culture-based education, and we have a new book called Honoring Our Heritage, which is also free online, full text. Uh, and uh, we weren't able to send his speech back to him before he passed away uh, to get him to re-edit it, but uh, we, we do have his uh, speech he gave, and he worked with the Creed uh, Center uh, I'm having a brain freeze, and, uh, but they're the ones that have done the SEOP model. Uh, that's where that came from for second language acquisition that uh, seems to be the best we know in terms of teaching English as a second language, and he worked with them on culture-based education. So we have culture, the community, the actual, whether it's Tuba City or... Uh, Rural community, urban community, of course, a lot of Amer Native Americans live in urban areas today. And the place, whether it's Los Angeles or out in a rural area, Navajo, Navajo Reservation, or up in uh, northern Alaska. And all of these three things have to be brought, I think, into the classroom if we want to engage Native American students. So he... In his speech and in his writings, Dr. Demer, and he was a, he was a founder of the National Indian Education Association, incidentally. And one of my colleagues here, Dr. Willard Sekestawea Gilbert, is a former president of the National Indian Education Association, too, that uh, co-edited uh, several of these books with us uh, here. So culturally-based indigenous language use, culturally-based 
pedagogy, trying to, through home visits and other ways, uh, trying to find out how kids learn to learn at home. Uh, when I got a job out on the Navajo Reservation in the early 70s, some grandmother told me, all you white people, I just come out here for the money. I said, yeah, $8,000 a year. I needed a job. But I went and they had just opened the first tribal college in the nation. It was actually held in the high school at many farms. Now they have their own campus, uh, Navajo Community College. Now it's Dinit College. And uh, so I... I signed up for a course in Navajo language, and I signed up for a course in Navajo history and culture. That's where I met my wife, was in the history and culture. I'd read two books about the Navajo by then, thought I was an expert, and uh, as a Navajo, she told me what I didn't know, <laughs> that I didn't know what I was talking about. Culturally-based curriculum, that doesn't mean you stop there, but you start there. Culturally based patterns of participation and leadership and decision making. Some evidence that uh, the democratic ideals of the Iroquois had something to do with the development of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, American Indians tended to do things by consensus, not just majority rule, but getting everybody to agree on things. Wouldn't it be nice if we could get our Congress to do that? They would just sit down and talk until they could come to a compromise. Culturally based methods of assessing student performance, not just paper and pencil tests. And they developed uh, rubrics for all of these, uh, Dr. Demert and his colleagues, and I'm hoping that this, I need to uh, follow up on, on uh, one of the former presidents, the NIEA, uh, uh, Dr. David Bolio uh, has been working on this, too. So the creed principles of effective teaching, uh, teachers and students working together, joint productive activity. This is based on extensive research, starting with the Kamehameha Early Education Program in Hawaii, and then in uh, with the creed at uh, Santa Cruz, University of California, Santa Cruz. Development of language and literacy across the curriculum. Uh, when I started teaching sixth grade math on the Navajo Reservation, the uh, kids could uh, do 5 plus 5 and 125 times 260 pretty well. But the minute I gave them a word problem, they ran into trouble. Uh, uh, and it never dawned on me back then, I had, should have had my students write their own word problems rather than just do word problems out of the book, that if they wrote their own word problems, just like if you want kids to be able to learn how to read a graph, get them to grasp the heights of kids in their classroom or grasp something real and then see how a graph is developed and then you can understand how to read it. Connecting lessons to students' lives. And, of course, many Native American students are very assimilated. So uh, you can't assume that they are that they are culturally traditional at all, whether they live on the reservation or the city. Contextualize teaching and curriculum and students' existing experiences, home, community, and school as a place to start with. Of course, almost all the kids I know like dinosaurs, and they don't relate to any community, school. Uh, uh, so uh, you don't you, you don't want to fixate on this. Engaging students with challenging lessons, maintain challenging standards for student performance, design activities to advance understanding to more complex levels, get kids to think for themselves, not just regurgitate things on tests. And so the continued emphasize dialogue over lectures. I wish I did that more in my classes at college. It's easier said than done, especially as class sizes uh, get larger. But uh, teacher-student dialogue, uh, getting beyond these scripted dialogues that you can find in some of these teachers' editions, uh, small group activities, and what instructional conversations that, that came out of the Creed research, learning through observation. My chemistry in high school, we spent half the time in the lab mixing chemicals. And even a few small explosions, as I remember. Encouraging student decision-making, involving students in the choice or design of instructional activities. 
If you want to do a thematic unit, let the kids decide whether in early grades, whether it's going to be dinosaurs, whales, or something else, or in the upper grades, whether it's going to be courage or some other abstract concept. And so um, the psychosocial uh, well-being continuum rubrics uh, get kids to have strong, positive indigenous identities. And, of course, what happened in those boarding schools was just the opposite. Identities were devalued. I have a card that I got in Alaska, and I don't have a... Uh, slide for it, but the little wallet card, which I still keep in my wallet, has uh, it, it, Yupik values, and they include humility, hard work, respect for others, cooperation, all values that I would want for my kid or any kid. Active, practical, traditional spirituality, and of course, uh, this you need to be careful about religion, but spirituality is something that's common to all religions, I know. Understand and demonstrate responsibility to family, community, and a broader society. Uh, when I worked at Rough Rock, Rocky Boy Community School, which is near Rough Rock, uh, that was one of the main concerns of the school board, was that the kids were becoming Americanized. They, they, were, they, they, they were losing the sense of responsibility to their extended families that that was the, provided social co cohesion to the community showed continuing development of cognitive and intellectual skills those understands and respects and applies kinesthetic activity for physical development i'm hearing about schools where because they're so obsessed with test scores that they've gotten rid of pe and, again, they develop rubrics to go along with this. And then some more research out of Hawaii. They have some money there to, to do research. Research tends to cost. Uh, they found five basic elements that compromise culture-based education, of course, language. And they're working with revitalizing the Hawaiian language, which... Thirty years ago, only people over 80 pretty much spoke, and now they have children learning it, and those kids do very – we have some graduates of their Hawaiian Immersion School here at NAU going to college. Uh, family and community, actively involving family and community in development of curricula, everyday learning and leadership, context, structuring the school and the classroom in culturally appropriate ways, uh, in uh, the Navajo Immersion School, uh, kids interact with each other using Navajo kinship terms. Uh, content, making learning meaningful and relevant through culturally grounded content and assessment, and then data and accountability. Uh, we need to see that this is working, that it doesn't degenerate into uh, just arts and crafts. And then this biggest study that I have found, and I have Boy, if any of the audience know other studies, I'd love to hear about them. This Kamehameha Schools looked at, uh, and we're missing a little bit of the number of the teachers, but 2,969 students, 2,000 parents, big study, 62 participating schools. And this very recent study found that culturally-based education positively affects students' socio-emotional well-being their sense of identity, self-efficacy, that they can do things, they can learn to read, they can do math. You know, it might be a struggle, but, you know, if you fall down six times, you get up seven. That kind of strong sense of identity, social relationships. Bullying is a big issue right now. Well, Navajo kinship terms, if you're related to everybody, you're not going to bully them, or at least it's a lot less likely. Uh, Culture-based education enhanced socio-emotional well-being in turn positively affects math and reading test scores. And it, it positively related to math and reading test scores for all students, and particularly for those with low socio-emotional development, most notably when supported by overall CBE, CBE use within the school. 
and I'll stop there for questions. Okay, thank you, John. Wow, um, that was a plethora of information, actually. And you mentioned um, consistently uh, engaging uh, the students with their community and the community with the school. Um, I have a participant who had submitted a question regarding um, building on the child's experience and how she engages the students and other teachers to build on the child's experience, make instruction more meaningful. However, she notes that children often relate more to pop culture than their ethnic culture. Do you find that to be uh, the same uh, among Native American uh, teenagers, youth, children? Oh, yeah. And if uh, so, how do you juggle the two? Well, I, I've just got a two-volume book, American Indians and Popular Culture, uh, and, you know, uh, you can think about the indigenous people of the planet Pandora and Avatar, popular culture, and have students look at, you know, how, how realistic is this Hollywood vision? And in the Twilight series, it's the Quilio Indians, but it was, of course, written by a non-Indian. So you can get kids to look at pop culture, especially how pop culture portrays Native Americans and, and, and have them look at these stereotypes and write about it, uh, I think. Uh, and, you know, this gets into social studies as, as well as uh, writing. And I, I think you can connect it in a number of ways. I have my students here at college read Sherman Alexie's uh, The Absolutely True Story of a Part-Time Indian, or okay. True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, uh, because a lot of uh, Native Americans – they are part-time Indians because they are, they have these ties to this tradition, but they have the ties to the modern, ties to the modern pop culture. And to get kids to think about that and, 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 and what is uh, hollow about pop culture and what isn't hollow about pop culture. Uh, yeah. Uh, and how they don't portray Indians in some accurate. pop culture. Yeah. Often. Sometimes yeah. they do a fairly good job, but not, a lot of times they don't, yes. Yeah. And so how would you get the students to engage their culture or participate uh, and implement some of that in the curriculum or get teachers, if you're training teachers, to actually receive some of that and implement it in the curriculum? Uh, you know, it, it, when I was a teacher, uh, creativity, coming up with ideas, wasn't my best. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can take uh, – there, there's a number of ways. Uh, the second part of this uh, talk uh, gives a lot of examples of curriculum material that have attempted to do that. Not so much pop culture, mm -hmm. but uh, you can uh, – uh, Country Western music is part of Navajo culture. Okay. If you listen to the Navajo Tribal 50,000 watt station, and you can listen to it at night in California, uh, it's uh, at AM 660. A lot of Country Western music. That's part of the Navajo culture now. And uh, my niece's teacher, Kayenta, on the Navajo Nation had her students uh, find metaphors in country western songs. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a, a good idea because then you're using the culture and also uh, the surrounding um, venues to bring into the classroom and they can relate it outside of the classroom and in their community. That's one idea. Um, we'll continue because I know the second part will get more into implementing culture into the curriculum and how to engage the students. But just for a show of hands, I would like to see how many people are actually participating in groups. And if you would click on the electronic hands, then I would just get an idea of how many people are participating in groups. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. And we'll continue our webinar with John. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to show you some examples about what I think can be done and has been done. Uh, I picked up this particular book. It was uh, eight and a half by eleven, maybe sixty pages, 
It's lost in my bookcase somewhere here. Uh, this was done up in uh, British Columbia at a, one of the native villages, uh, and it is a book about their their, their town of Alexandria, a small uh, First Nations village. And you can do all kinds of social studies through this and reading. Uh, and I don't have any of the pages in here, but there were pictures taken around the community, the discussion of the community, some of the history of the community, uh, some of the important people in the community, and that kind of thing. And, and they had, and, uh, a number of First Nations villages had done this. Uh, they, they gave me a couple and I scanned this one, but, uh, seemed to me that were at least 10 or 15 that I saw some years ago. Uh, this is from the far north, and uh, it uh, is sort of the example you often see. You, you see the traditional stuff, and I, but I, I want to get on to something more modern. But uh, it pays to be traditional at times. You get out in the far north in a skidoo, and your motor breaks down, you can be... Uh, not survive, where some of the traditional stuff, if you had, uh, you could get back. This is uh, a sled, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, I was a principal and bilingual director at the Hart Butte Community School, and if you send off books to uh, get published elsewhere, you notice they misspelled my name on the cover. <laughs> but I just went around and took pictures of the community and then gave them to the kindergarten teacher who had the students who up there spoke English, and and the bilingual teacher uh, back translated it into uh, Blackfeet. Uh, but the, actually, I said it's by me, but it should have been by the by the uh, kindergarten students. And uh, if I ever republish this, I would have it by the kindergarten students. Uh, that's the backbone in the world, and there the Rocky Mountains behind the school that's sort of energy efficient embedded. This is on the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana. This is the Wallapai tribe, the people of the uh, pines uh, in Arizona. And uh, this is also produced by one of the bilingual projects, the historical land sites of the Wallapai tribe. So this would be social studies. Uh, this is uh, from Rock Point Community School. And this is a big, thick book, hundreds of pages. Uh, now published by University of Arizona Press, and this is just page 238 out of it to show that it is not always Navajo blankets and stuff. A uh, major source of income from the tribe is a Peabody coal strip mine. Uh, the effects of strip mining on the reservation, as well as to the reservation tribe's budget, uh, is uh, significant, and all kinds of science can be taught through this. And and I think that, you know, rather than a one-size-fits-all chemistry textbook or science textbook that has something from, say, Appalachia, though obviously you could compare this with Appalachia, would, would uh, engage students more as a starting point. Uh, this uh, came from Tuba City, from my son's chemistry teacher, uh, book of the uh, Navajo uranium miners, uh, and it was a bilingual text. Some of it was in Navajo and some of it was in English, and uh, the Navajo ladies became widows because of the exposure to radiation and, the, and cancer 10, 15 years later of their husbands. Uh, ethnobotany of the Wallapai again, and uh, this particular ethnobotany, uh, traditional uses of the plant, uh, uh, the uh, Latin name for the plant, and then the uh, Wallapai description of the plant, the uh, Wallapai language there. Uh, this is from Wallapai too, where the students went out. And in the old days, you could have the students take their own pictures and develop them black and white. Color developing was a little complicated, usually, for doing in a school. But when I was at uh, Havasupai Reservation, eight miles down the Grand Canyon, we put up a little dark room and an unused restroom, and uh, aides and the students uh, took pictures and developed them. But uh, again, 
eating the tuna of cactus much more healthy than going to McDonald's for most of what people eat, though McDonald's, of course, has salads and healthy food now. Uh, so the kids took pictures and uh, and wrote about this. And, again, this was all in the Wallapai language, including the title page. And this is an example of one of the pages. This is uh, something out of the regional education laboratory, the western one, uh, ethnomathematics, uh, that uh, you can uh, connect. Uh, grandmother will take five minutes to weave each row. How many minutes will it take her to weave the rug? So you could insert something like this in the appropriate place in the uh, standards. My little dig at rainforest math. <laughs> uh, that's when when uh, you lose the math and just l look at the culture. Uh, this is from Canada again. I think uh, these are sort of beginning reading text you, textbooks. Manabush is a cultural hero. Uh, he's called Napi on the Blackfeet Reservation, but in the Tomi on some of the Plains Indian Reservation. And there's a whole series of stories. These are in English. Uh, and they tend to describe how uh, animals got the way they were and things like that, and how Coyote can trick himself and tries to be too smart for his own good. Uh, so you can teach reading about this, but uh, there's also lessons in life, and you can contrast this to what scientists do in terms of trying to determine why animals look the way they do. Uh, this is a book coming out of the Santa Fe Institute, which was a national magnet school for American Indians. And T.D. Allen was an English teacher. It was a school for arts, and now it's a tribal college. Uh, uh, but back then it was high school, and she talks about getting kids to use their five senses. You know, don't don't tell me, show me. Uh, uh, and uh, one of her assignments was to get kids to uh, write short autobiographies, write about something you know about. You know, that's how uh, the lady that wrote, uh, get my memory here, uh, Little House on the Prairie or uh, Little Women, you know, some of those authors tried to write about knights in shining armor and weren't very successful, and then they started writing about how they grew up, uh, the one on Prince Edward Island, uh, Montgomery, uh, Anna Green Gables. Well, talk about Laura it. Ingalls. <laughs> Emerson Black Horse Mitchell took this 10, 15-page high school assignment and kept writing and writing and writing, and his autobiography was published by first the University of Oklahoma Press and then now University of Arizona. So that's a... You know, you're not going to engage all students that much. And you can see how his writing is improved over the length of this uh, uh, book, uh, that uh, the grammar and stuff is better at the end of the book than at the start of the book, when he, because he started at the earliest he could remember. And towards the end of the school year, we was doing the, at the beginning of the school year, towards the end of the school year, he was finishing it up. Uh, this is, came out of Havasupai Bilingual Program when I was down there as the bilingual director and chief administrator. And some of this poetry was uh, later published in the New York publication with the tribe's permission. And uh, Mick Fidulo, the poet who came down, he was a consultant, he told students not to use adjectives like beautiful, bad, cute, good, nice, pretty, and ugly that don't show don't really describe anything, show, don't tell. Uh, let the reader make their decision whether it's pretty based on your your use of your five senses describing things. Excuse me. Uh, this is actually a poem there. Oh, I got ahead of myself again. Uh, Francis Signella. Uh, we just had students go down to have a soup by. There's still no road down there. There's an eight-mile trail. Uh, but some of these poems were uh, that these kids wrote in a very short time. And I had this poet up at Blackfeet Reservation and uh, the year before, and somebody said, well, who wrote these poems? Did that 
guy edited them. And so I actually went into the classrooms at Havasupai the following year, and he helped them with a little bit of punctuation. But it was the kids that were writing the poems. Of course, he gave them a, a, there's different types of poem tree forms, haiku and stuff like that. And he gave them a form and some sample poems, some by Indian poets and uh this is the book that some of those poems from Havasupai were reprinted in. I don't know if it's still in uh, in print or not. Uh, this is a poetry book from the Blackfeet Reservation, uh, and this is a bilingual one with poems in Blackfeet and English. Uh, we did a we had a linguist down. Uh, they called him a Japapai. He was from the University of Kansas, a Japanese ancestry, but he could speak uh, Wallapai and Havasupai, which are closely related. And he had the kids in Havasupai do a Havasupai poetry book. Uh, this is the Foxfire idea, uh, having kids go out and interview people about uh, various uh, community activities. Uh, with Foxfire, it was making banjos and stuff like that in the Appalachia. Uh, here's an example of making a Navajo sash belt. And all the types of things that you do in terms of getting kids to write five-paragraph essays and to uh, uh, indent and proper grammar and stuff can be done, you know, the process writing in terms of doing these books. This came from Raymond Navajo School in New Mexico. Uh, and they were publishing this for a number of years. This is the newspaper from Rock Point Community School, which was bilingual. I uh, picked the part on the uh, official voice position on the English-only bill, but if you can see on the articles on both sides, uh, were all written in Navajo, and this was done by students. Most of this particular newspaper was done by interviewing. Mm -hmm. Students would interview tribal officials, teachers, anybody that could get their hands on it. And, of course, students had a choice on who they wanted to interview. Uh, giving students a choice is one way to engage them versus saying, you do this. Uh, of course, choice within limits. Uh, and I wanted to, towards the end here, look at, again, I showed you what the United Nations has said. I'll give you an example of the largest tribe outside the Cherokee, uh, what they have said about what they want for their children. And Navajo Tribal Chairman Peterson Zaw wrote in the introduction to the education policies back in 1980s, we believe that an excellent education can produce achievement in the basic academic skills and skills required by modern technology and still educate young Navajo citizens in their language, history, government, and culture. There's some research, that, pretty strong research, that bilingual kids are more cognitively effective, uh, get the right word there, more cognitively flexible than monolingual kids. And also some research that being bilingual uh, less chance of Alzheimer's in later life. Keeps your brain more active. Navajo policies required schools serving Navajo students to have courses in Navajo history and culture, supported local control, parental involvement, Indian preference in hiring. Because if there's no jobs for these kids getting high school diplomas, why get a high school diploma? We need to have employment for kids. You know, we're coming out of a great recession. Uh, you know, in the Great Depression, we had the CCC and the Works Progress Administration. My son, Sosi, went to a high school in Billings, Montana, that was partly built as a WPA project, Works Progress Administration, during the Great Recession. These weren't just make-work projects to put kids to work and young men and men to work and women. Uh, they actually produce infrastructure for this nation that, you know, I can go and find in a picnic area a uh, cement picnic table that has CCC in it. We have to provide jobs or, or kids won't see education as important. 
They declare that Navajo language is an essential element of the life, culture, and identity of Navajo people. The Navajo Nation, this is from the policy, recognizes the importance of preserving and perpetuating the language to the survival of the nation. Instruction in the Navajo language shall be made available for all grade levels in all schools serving the Navajo Nation. They got that further along by there's a Manuelito Scholarship uh, and to get the Manuelito Scholarship from the tribe, you have to have taken Navajo language uh, in high school. Navajo language instruction shall include to the greatest extent practicable thinking, speaking, comprehension, reading, and writing skills in the study of formal grammar of the language. And, of course, you can take these courses now uh, online as well if you're off the reservation, off the nation. Uh, Rust Rock Demonstration School, that was the first native control school in modern times. This is an example of a Navajo history book that they put together. There's also an example I have of one the BIE put together. The, back then it was the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, Office of Education, but uh, uh, materials that relate to the culture. There, there's a long history of this. This isn't anything new. Uh, Alaska has been, is to be especially commended for the work they've done on culturally based education. I'm going up to Anchorage at the end of April to be at their, uh, bilingual most cultural conference, speak at it. Uh, and again, this, uh, if you Google the title, you should come up with it because these, this is online, uh, full text. Uh, we also have some of it in this book we did here that's online, uh, And basically arguing, if you want to engage students, we need to bring in their background. Now, again, we need to expand it. Uh, on the Rocky Boy Reservation, that's Chippewa Cree up in Montana, I used to take around and we used to have book fairs. Uh, part of reading is fundamental, and we extended it. And one of the most grabbed-on books that kids wanted to read was the uh, Guinness Book of Records, the biggest, the tallest, the weirdest. So, you know, it's not just culture that interests kids, but it, culture is one thing. Uh, I asked the librarian what the kids were interested in at Chin Lee in the early 70s when I was there. And she named two things, and I can't remember the one, but the other one was the Western Horseman. It's a magazine. They were interested in horses when my... Uh, Wife was teaching down on the Havasupai Reservation, 7th and 8th grade. Uh, one of the kids, very reluctant reader, behind grade level, got into a rodeo story. And the first three chapters he that featured American Indians, uh, first three chapters, he it was a struggle to get him to get going and get started. But then he got into it and... Uh, I'm not sure it was, I can't put it down, but he really got engaged in that book. And, you know, we teach kids to read, but we don't give them enough time and practice to read often, especially if there's no books in the home. Uh, I was reading a, by a book about a teacher on one of the New Mexico reservations back in 1903, and the kids wanted to read. These were returnees from the boarding school. Indian Boyhood, uh, a book by a Sioux author back then, and the other, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the other book. Oh, The Middle Five, a, a story about Omaha boys at a boarding school and their little gang, not in the gang in the sense of uh, we think of gangs today. Uh, this summer, uh, we're going to have another conference. Uh, and we hope to put another publication that will be freely available to the web, uh, back up. Uh, and, and I think more needs to be done to uh, push engagement. One more thing on reading. It's like, you know, good basketball players, part of it's coaching. But the other thing is practice, practice, practice. If you want kids to practice, 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 you've got to engage them in something. You know, whether it's... Uh, Harry Potter, which some kids like and some kids don't like. Uh, Twilight series, or what is it now? The uh, Hunger Games. Uh, uh, the, and again, for for younger kids. Uh, and there, there's lots of good Indian books that we need, Native American books written by 
some by, written by Native American authors. And we need to we need to make those things available to kids as well as expose them to the greater environment of the United States and to the world. And uh, I'll finish up with that. <laughs> okay, thank you, John. We have a lot of questions. Um, you made a wonderful mention of different ways in which students contributed their stories. Um, you presented a lot of the different books in which their stories were presented, either in the Willapai, um language or in English when they were eating the tuna from the cactus um, and how it was written about and, and displayed, how students contributed. And I don't know if it was just the students or their parents or those in the community, um, stories written in Blackfeet. You know, I just wonder, and a couple of the participants have submitted this, how do you get the students to uh, – participate and submit their stories and engage and how is that done I mean who is responsible for implementing culturally based education is it the teacher the principal administrator well you certainly you, you need community support you need administrative support you need teacher buy in you need mm -hmm. it all uh, in terms of getting kids engaged I think it really helps to show them models and models that, you know, uh, that other Native kids or other kids have done elsewhere uh, to, you know, to give them an idea. And, and then to ask them, do you think this would be a good idea, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just say, we're going to do this. Right, right. Uh, and get so, buy-in. Exactly, get buy-in from everyone really, not just administrators and teachers, but the community as well? Yeah. Uh, I came across the biography of Ann Nolan Clark. She wrote a couple biographies. One I had to really search for. She was a teacher on the, one of the Pueblo reservations in uh, New Mexico. And uh, before she got a job with Native Americans, she was working in Gallup, New Mexico with Mexican Americans. And her principal who had actually gone to Columbia University and was a student of John Dewey, made her go out and do home visits. Mm. Find out what the parents are like, what, what, what the kids are faced with. Is there any place for them to do homework at home if you assign homework? Is there any, uh, what are their parents, what's the kid interested in? What, you know, is it, is it horses? Is it something else? Is it, is it computers? Uh, uh, you know, home visits. Uh, Dr. Dick Littlebear, he's currently the tribal college president on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, talks about teachers crossing the cattle guard. This is reservation teachers that live in teacherages. And uh, crossing the cattle guard because there's a fence around the schools to keep the cows off and the horses off. And some teachers just jump in their car when they leave the compound and go to the nearest city, but they never get out in the community to see what the community's interests are like, what what they want to do, and uh, you know, and 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 to get. If you want the community to buy, parental support is essential. But if you don't listen to parents and just assume they're going to support you because education is important, well, it, historically, education for American Indians has been to separate them from their culture, uh, from their religion. Mm -hmm traditional religion, uh, and and so uh, learning about the community and getting their support, and, and some parents want an assimilationist education. They got that, and that's what they want, and so you need to be careful there, too, but that's why I showed you the tribal policies, right. uh, because uh, that those are elected tribal consuls, and, and you can sort of get the feeling for the, and a lot of tribes now have Department of it. Departments of Education. Oh, okay. Now, majority of the teachers, are the teachers Native American Indians? How can a teacher who doesn't know the language incorporate language in the curriculum and the culture of Native American elves? Well, one thing I did in the early 70s, and I was lucky, I went and took Navajo language the first semester I was out there. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn Navajo, but I learned one that's hard to learn those languages, so Obviously, for kids going the other way, it's hard for them. And I learned a few words. 
Uh, I learned how to say sit down in Navajo to my students. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, and, and I think you can be supportive of efforts. I see these immersion programs, or they're trying to revitalize the language as being extremely successful. And, and, and not just academically with the kids, but in the kids' behavior. And as the kids get older, behavior becomes one of, you know, if you have good discipline, uh, you can teach a lot. But boy, if you don't, it, it's very hard. And so the, the types of values that are being taught in these immersion programs or just teach traditional values in English, that, that these are values that come not from the white culture, or if they come from the white culture, it's because they're universal values that were found in your culture as well, your native. Uh, okay. And I have a couple more. I'm just going to pick out and kind of consolidate some of them because sure. I know we're slowly running out on time. But how does – okay, we have a couple who would like to actually go on the reservation and um, – you know, uh, engage learners. How does that happen, um, and is it possible, and how does one prepare for this as a white teacher? Well, if you know where you're going, you can read some books. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is limited, as my wife told me. <laughs> yeah. uh, depending on the area, there's a tremendous shortage on the Navajo Nation, for example, of special ed teachers, math teachers, so they're desperate. They bring them in from the Philippines. Mm. And the students have trouble with the accents. The Philippine teachers have more culture shock than somebody that that grew up in America, in the United States. Uh, so uh, you could, you know, see if there's anybody from that tribe in your mm -hmm. area. University of Indiana, I think, actually sends out their student teachers to live in dorms and, and do student teaching on the reservation. Uh, uh, we have some, uh, you know, uh, we have a teacher education program here, and some of the some of the uh, professors really try to get their students uh, to learn more about all the cultures in Arizona. But you know, the Navajo Reservation is just 30 miles out of town here, the border, and so uh, now. There's one teacher, one participant, and then there's a couple. But I'm just going to ask this really quick. We have, like, a American Indians, there's a reservation, and they're implementing interdisciplinary thematic units to their students. But they get a lot of pushback. Um, there's not a lot of support. Um, any advice? Well, it would be who's not supporting it. Uh, I... Did some for this type of transformation, because it's interdisciplinary, so it's not just say uh, within math or science, but uh, all of them I working together. Mm -hmm. You have to get teacher buy to use American. Okay. Uh, I was doing some observations, and uh, the three or four teachers, social studies, math. Uh, science, I think, we're doing one on the Iditarod sled dog race in Alaska. This was, though, at Wyoming Indian School in Wyoming. So the math teacher, they were keeping track of how far they went each day, the sleds. Uh, I think the science teacher was doing something about the weather in Alaska, how it compared to, to Wyoming weather. Uh, social, ed, social studies teacher was having them read, uh, Julia the Wolves, which is a story about Alaska. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, it was the English teacher, I think, that was doing Julia the Wolves. So, uh, but you have to get teacher buy-in there. Uh, uh, I think if, if, if it's mandated, and uh, you're, you're going to have trouble. And they didn't have every teacher buying in, but three or four of them did. This was a departmentalized uh, middle school, junior high level. And, uh, again, I think some examples and, uh, and, and to give some teachers some help, maybe bring in some professional development, uh, mm -hmm. for the teachers because 
You know, the easiest thing is to open up that darn teacher's guide. Now we can require teachers to do fidelity oaths uh, that they're not going to vary from this teacher's guide. Uh, and so uh, you need to get buy-in. You need to get professional development. You need to get administrative support and parental support, too, that, you know, that this is going to further helping kids raise test scores, not distract us from test prep. Now, there are those who work on different reservations who have had little or no success in engaging parental involvement and community support. Do you have any suggestions before we close out our webinar? Well, the way we got parents in several of the schools, or at least the administration did, I wasn't always the administrator, was uh, provide food. <laughs> <laughs> Good old food, uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, try to engage uh, now a lot of the schools the elementary you get a lot of native teachers in the elementary levels uh, mm -hmm. uh, and they're often parents so one thing is to ask them uh, the, there's usually less native teachers at the high school level but uh, uh, listen and and, and Listen rather than tell, I would say. Listen rather than tell. Listen to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been told too long what 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 they need and what they want and what's good for them. I think. And uh, if you go, you know, one of the native values is humility. Mm -hmm. I think if you go in with uh, an attitude, not that I really, you know, the not as a missionary, I'm going to save your kids. I'm going to help your kids. Uh, uh, but with the attitude, uh, what can I do? What do you want to do that I can help you with? Right. And really listen to them. Yeah. It's a very good advice. Very good advice. Well, um, thank you so much, John. This has been wonderful. I wish we had more time. Uh, we do have some questions that I will forward, uh, the questions that have not been asked today over to John, and he will email you the responses. But I'd like to thank everyone, uh, John, Trini, and all the participants for um, listening in to today's webinar on Engaging Native American Youth in Learning, presented by John Rayner, Trinidad Torres, with remarks from Trini, and hosted by the National Clearinghouse for English Language Acquisition and SELA located at the Graduate School of Education and Human Development at the George Washington University. If you'd like more information or if you have additional questions, please contact Trinidad Torres Carrion at trinidad.torres, T-O-R-R-E-S, hyphen Carrion, C-A-R-R-I-O-N, at ed.gov, or John Rayner at john.reyhner, at nau.edu. And if you have additional questions regarding the webinar itself, please contact Katya Flemens at kflemens at gwu.edu. This concludes our webinar for today, and the webinar will be archived uh, in about two to three days on our website at www.ncela. Dot gwu.edu forward slash webinars. Thank you.